Welcome to this episode where I have one of my beautiful human sisters, Marissa, here with me today. I have had just the utmost pleasure and joy to get to know you from a yoga studio that I was a part of and the beautiful teachings that you provide there. And I'm so excited to hear about your journey. We're going to dive into all of the impactful moments that helped you find clarity, wake up to your life, and really start living intentionally, living consciously as you are moving about the world now. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me, Brie. Yes. How are you feeling today? Let's see. Today, I'm feeling a little sleepy Mm -hmm. and very happy. (laughs) So almost like this child, like, like I'm moving through the day, like a child. (laughs) Those are the best days. (laughs) Absolutely. I totally agree. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Yes, we, I think I'll speak for myself, but I think we fell in love on your last podcast. (laughs) I've been on your millennial mating uh, podcast a couple of times now, which you definitely go check out if you haven't listened to this podcast, because the way that you orchestrate conversations and bring on specific guests for your audience is truly beautiful. So I have had so much fun with you. Same, same, same. And I will say, I feel a bit vulnerable, although I know this will be a very collaborative conversation just because we're so comfortable with each other. I feel a bit vulnerable when I'm being the one that's asked questions rather than the question master. Oh, yeah. (laughs) This is a new seat for me, but I'm (laughs) I'm excited. (laughs) This is a place that we honor vulnerability and just how much freaking courage it takes to, to be vulnerable. I think that word is thrown around a lot of like, you know, vulnerability and vulnerability is courage, right? And Brené Brown really brought a lot of awareness into this idea of being vulnerable. But what it is to be truly vulnerable is it's an act that if you haven't done it before, like there's always, and even if you have done it before, There's always some anxiety. There's always some like some heart fluttering moments that that are (laughs) before the actual event and and to do that anyway and to show yourself and let yourself be seen is such a beautiful quality. I even think about the theme of your podcast being like waking up and becoming more awake to whatever moment that you're in. And I don't know if we can be fully awake without vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we are. (laughs) We're in denial and asleep, or we're awake and we're vulnerable and we're exposed. (laughs) Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And that process of continually waking up and falling asleep and waking up. There's a lot of misconception, I think, that you do your work, quote unquote, and then you're done. And you're awake forever and like nothing can touch you. And obviously we are not able to reach that level of enlightenment. So there's a lot of people who give up on the work because they're like, I've already done this shit. Why, why is the same thing surfacing again? And why, why haven't I mastered this yet? And it can feel, it can feel defeating. Absolutely. I was thinking about this today about how I think so many of us live so much of our life asleep to what's actually happening whether we are like in a dream state of discursive loops in our mind whether we are in a dream state of doubt um and it, it it's really not until you can drop into whatever's actually happening in your life that's when you wake up and it can be scary as hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's like finding your breath from a more yogic Vipassana perspective, whether that's even like first thing in the morning, sometimes right after I wake up, before I look at my phone, I try to stay in like a primal state. Yeah. I'll like 
roll out of bed, sit on the floor and move right into like, this sounds wild, but I'll move right into some sort of like gentle breath work. Mm. So I can get ahead of my mind. Yes. Interrupting that, that autopilot, right? It's like, you know, when you're driving somewhere and then you, you get to your destination you're like, how did I get here? It's like, you like, (laughs) you know, you know how to do it so well. It's so ingrained that you just like completely your mind just like shut off. Like when we are going through the motions of even to your point, waking up in the morning, immediately grabbing the phone, immediately scrolling on the news, feeling the anxiety, feeling the anger, going and brushing our teeth, like whatever we're doing in our, in our sequence of events to be conscious enough to interrupt that and to disrupt that tendency to go towards comfort or go towards what we know again is so it takes so much vulnerability so much courage because what might happen if you sit and do breath work with yourself in the morning right like what might the silence bring forth for you to pay attention to or what truth might be uncovered that if you were scrolling on the news or doing your your normal thing like it'd be too loud to hear that thing yes Yes. And I think obviously we're all human and we all move in and out of this like wakeful, alert, present state. And sometimes we feel very lethargic. Like I asked you to reschedule last week because my brain was just like not here. (laughs) So it's always sort of this ebb and flow, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that you can feel when somebody is there with you. Yeah. Really in the moment with you. Yep. You can see it in their eye contact. You can even see it in the way that they breathe or their body language. Mm-hmm. And that is such a I think rare and important skill these days because we are so fucking distracted. <laughs> it's so easy to be distracted oh my god we're just in squirrel mode all the time yes. like, uh-huh. uh-huh yeah yeah which let's talk a little bit about yoga a little bit about your teaching and where you are now because I think what you bring into the world in form of your gifts that I truly believe and know have been exposed through a lot of a lot of moments in your life that probably weren't so wonderful. You cultivated these gifts and you now have them, you, you give them to the world in the form of yoga. One of the gifts, you have many gifts, but talk a little bit about your teaching. What brought you to yoga? Kind of how did you land in that space? Yes, I love talking about yoga and the yogic path because I think oftentimes there is a lot of misconception about yoga being about positivity and almost like rainbows and lululemon and perfect tree poses and inversions um when the yogic path and and what we've learned from the yoga sutras and these ancient teachings is the yogic path isn't necessarily about optimism or pessimism it's about realism yeah like exactly what we just talked about. It's about honoring where you are in your life, where you are on the path and accepting yourself and being with yourself where you are. So I I really found yoga at a, a very dark time in my life. I was in my early 20s and I've been so blessed that I... I was born into privilege. I grew up with a beautiful, tight-knit family and truly just like, I I felt like I was living in a dream state up until then. And in my early 20s, I lost my dad and he was like, I'm his carbon copy in spirit, absolutely. And for me, it was a very sudden tragic just overall fucking earth shattering loss yeah and I had no idea where to go um therapy was beautiful 
I still talk to that therapist today. Mm. But there was something missing for me where I felt like I couldn't find the ground. I couldn't find equilibrium in my heart or my mind. Mm. And this beautiful opportunity arose and I ended up spending hours and hours with one of my favorite yoga teachers and we spent hours and hours sitting in silence we spent hours and hours doing really difficult breath work to just like have that emotional cathartic release Mm -hmm. we spent hours and hours just like sitting in and feeling the pain and for me, I think I was gravitated towards this yogic path because in that safe space, that safe container of a yoga room, nobody was trying to fix me. Nobody was trying to turn me back into the old Marissa who was incredibly bubbly and effervescent and carefree. Um, And nobody was trying to like transform my pain into anything. It was just like, you are as you are and that's it. And maybe for this entire hour, you just lay the fuck down and breathe. Yeah. And that was so freeing and something I had never experienced before. Mm -hmm. So after that, you know, after being in silence and stillness with my grief and anger, and regret and uncertainty, um, it started to those emotions, those dense emotions, as you call them, which I love. It's mm-hmm. like a fog. It soon starts to disappear and dissipate, and it doesn't hold you. It doesn't hold you so tight anymore. Mm-hmm. Which we never want to hear that. We need to feel it you know (laughs) this too shall pass it's like ah fuck you like yeah we all know but (laughs) having those practices to just sit in it I think it's like that safe space to turn towards the big scary monster right like I think with grief specifically we run we run from the feelings of sadness or guilt or shame or or anger whatever is whatever is bubbling up because it's so intense and I cannot imagine the grief that comes from losing a parent and I can only imagine as an early 20 something how much fucking courage it took for you to turn towards that and sit with it instead of spending years running and drinking or using drugs or having sex or whatever numbing agent you want to choose that that typically is the first reflex for people where it's like this this hurts too much make it stop and don't get me wrong I definitely dabbled in that as well (laughs) both and (laughs) both and baby and I, I I often times think that the the bark is so much worse than the actual bite you know we are resilient beings Mm -hmm. our ancestors and their ancestors and ancestors before them had to withstand like famine and war and disease like we have this resilience in our dna and sometimes we don't realize it until we get knocked on our ass We have to like, as my friend Kelsey Brown says, like sit up into our pain rather than succumb to it. So I tried my best to do that. Um, It wasn't a, it was not a linear path by any means. (laughs) As grief is not, right? It's never, never predictable, never linear, which makes it so frustrating to try to navigate. Because again, with the, the idea of like, okay, I did that piece of work, it's done. It's like, nah, it might be, it might be settled for the moment. And then six months later, you might be at the grocery store and it might decide to pop up again and you fall on your knees, right? It's like, there's no control around feelings, which I think is why it feels so terrifying and people avoid, 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 avoid. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
experiencing that with one of my teachers who just was a human, you know, I, I was so blessed to have a mom who said she would support my brothers and I in therapy or whatever healing modality we needed to do. Um, but I found oftentimes I always felt like somebody was trying to fix me and I, it didn't feel good. So in, in sitting with my teacher and just being with it, I wanted to study these ancient teachings deeper and study under this teacher that I, I love so much so that I could hopefully one day sit with somebody in their pain mm -hmm. and not ask them questions unless they wanted me to and not try to fix them or mm -hmm. shake them. It's just like sitting with them. Yeah. So that's really why I wanted to become a yoga teacher was to do just that all of the physical benefits, all of the, uh, the rest of the practice is so beautiful. But I think personally, that is in addition to opening up the door for people to walk into the space and be exactly as they fucking are mm -hmm. and know that they will not be judged. Yeah. Yeah. And I speak from experience being a student in your classes before I knew you on any other level in any other way your classes felt like that warm hug like you walk into the room and it's like oh, like I belong here I feel safe here this class is going to be hard as shit but I'm like <laughs> I'm here for it you know and I love the frame of how you look at yoga and when what you stand for behind yoga because I know I have been guilty in my own intentions with yoga sometimes where it's like, I'm going for the workout and it's like, yes. And, you know, it always ends up being so challenging in my brain to slow down and to be present with my breath and be present with how my body feels when you're bending over. Right. It's like, there's so many uncomfortable sensations that come in yoga and the practice of coming back to your breath, like that is the work. That is the, the practice. It's not how many chaturangas you're going to do and get ripped arms, right? It's like, <laughs> it's the, it's the presence and the, the acceptance that you find within yourself because you feel like you're accepted in a group of people. Yes. And the, the class, the asana, it can serve as a mirror. I, I heard someone say once that how we do one thing is how we do everything. Yeah. And I, I subscribe to that statement. Yeah. So like, if you're, if you're holding say chair pose and your quads are on fire, your glutes and your mind is just fucking racing and you're reactive, it's possible that when you're in a disagreement with your partner, you are also reactive in that moment. Yeah. So it also serves as like a mirror um, in the, I could geek out about yoga. So I'm, if I'm geeking it. out so much, you just like haul me. Um, but I, I promise I'll bring it full circle. In, <laughs> in uh, the eightfold path, in the eight limbs of yoga, the word tapas, which is like heat, fire, and it also means austerity. It's paired with svadhyaya, which means self-study. So in yoga, and I also think in relationship, we, we put ourselves into these uncomfortable positions sometimes so that we can observe how we react. And whoa, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a wild ride. <laughs> that can be a wild ride, yes. <laughs> Yeah. What, what similarities, similarities did you find when you were, was that something of conscious thought when you were starting your yoga practice or, or have been practicing your yoga practice? Like observing myself. Yeah. Specific to relationships. Has there been any parallels that have been like, Oh fuck. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> As I shake my head. 100%. 
you know, I, I've been very, I've been very lucky in, in some ways to have only been in relationship with men who, although we're also messy and human, um, but we're never abusive. Um, so I think anything that I say, it does, does not apply to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll circle back with that in a minute. I found that when I was in relationship and that relationship felt turbulent, um, uncomfortable where I didn't feel like myself sitting in meditation or being in a yoga class was especially difficult Mm -hmm. because there was that mirror in class sitting in a five minute meditation when I knew I was in a relationship that just wasn't um wasn't serving me anymore or him Mm -hmm. there was always that parallel there was always that mirror now I preface this conversation this topic Because so much of meditation is strengthening your internal equanimity or like your calmness and composure, um, which yes, can be like a North Star. But I also think if when in abusive relationship, we have those, we have our fight or flight systems in place for a reason to keep us safe. Yeah. So if you're in a yoga class and you're in an unsafe relationship and your teacher says, uh, relax. What? <laughs> what? Like, I'm not going to soften my shoulders and put down my mitts because yeah. right now I'm in this state of turmoil and I need to keep my like Muhammad Ali mitts up to protect mm-hmm. myself. Um, so I think, Yes. The practice always serves as a mirror for something greater than what's happening in that moment. Although I didn't realize it in that in that moment, it's always in the looking back, right? When you put all the pieces together, (laughs) always. And hindsight can be such a bitch because we're we're looking at us then with the knowledge we have now, which is not a fair analysis because at that moment in time, we were doing the best we could with what we had. And if the best you could was to avoid thinking about it because it was too painful or you weren't ready or you weren't yet at the spot to see the red flag or to let your intuition speak, like that's fine. That's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. We're all on our journeys. We're all hitting our timing at different points. And there's so much embarrassment and shame that come along with that when you look back because it's like oh how did I not see that red flag or how did I let him continue to lie to me for five years or how did I you know believe x y and z when I knew I knew that that wasn't like how was I that girl at the bar that was crying asking her boyfriend not to leave yeah like how was I that girl even growing up with two older brothers, a strong dad, you know, yeah. it's always in the looking back. Mm-hmm. Two things came to mind. Esther Perel, sometimes she has her podcast where she will record couples therapy sessions. Yeah, and I've heard her more than once if the couple is super enraged and, and heated and they're arguing, she'll be like, okay, wait, stop, stop, stop. She's like, you both need to lay down on the ground. (laughs) And almost similar to what you're saying. And you'll hear them lay down on the ground and almost like start giggling. And it's like this this part of the therapy session where it's like they're they're children again. (laughs) Which again works well with a partner who's not manipulating you and and being abusive for sure. If you both can get on that that page in a safe space. Yeah. Yes. So yoga seems like it was obviously one of the pivotal things that helped you awaken, move towards a more conscious way of living. Tell us a little bit more about your relationships and sort of your journey, 
either tangentially with finding yoga or what, what were your relationships like then? And how are they now? Ooh, 92% <laughs> wild back then, probably um, 62% wild now. <laughs> I will say, I think that finding that intersection and coupling yoga with my relationships, I think when we lose ourselves in relationship, we have to find ourselves in silence and stillness. So in those moments where I was losing myself, although sitting in a seat by myself didn't, um, feel good it also was necessary whether that was the relationship of losing my dad um, or whether that was being in romantic relationship who with somebody who just wasn't wasn't right for my dna for my baggage for my mind my heart um you know i feel like when shit things happen we have to turn we have to find some good in it. Mm -hmm. So after losing my dad, I found yoga and I found meditation and I found a community that I felt safe in, held in. And then I think after my last breakup, I was like, what can I, what diamonds can I find in this donkey shit? (laughs) (laughs) What can I do with this? And that's when I finally pulled the trigger and kickstarted Millennial Mating, my podcast. Amazing. Because, like if we don't find some good after we sit in the anger, the regret, the grief, after those dense emotions release their grip on us, if we don't use that, that anger and uncertainty as diesel fuel for good, then what was the purpose of it? Yeah. So yeah, my last relationship really led me to millennial mating. And I had this realization of even if it's shit, I'm going to have a good time doing it. So (laughs) here we go. Let's take some pictures and some Calvin Klein's. Let's literally be naked physically and emotionally. Love it. Similar to what we talked about in the beginning of this podcast my favorite conversations to listen to are the vulnerable ones Mm -hmm. because there's so much main stage production happening with social media, even with podcasts. I like to listen to people talk about their humanity because that's where I can be like, oh yeah, that's me. Oh yeah, I did that last weekend. Like, oh, I'm not alone in this pain. (laughs) Yeah, it's so interesting that humans share so many common experiences, so many common feelings, uh, embarrassments, shame, uh, fears, you know, and we all think that we're alone in all of it, which I think is, it's such a unique experience for humans. I don't know, assuming animals don't go through this comparison or this like feeling like they have to put on the masks to be around other people, to be accepted. And that that understanding from our, you know, our ancestors, where if you weren't accepted, you were alone, you didn't have a tribe with you to protect you, and you were more vulnerable to die, right? That's like, literally something in our bodies that we hold. So to, to isolate ourselves and to not talk about our problems or not talk about what's really going on in our lives or with our partners or our family or whatever, because we don't want to be looked at like, the other <laughs> we don't want to be x'd out of the group or our friends think we're psychotic and never call yeah. us again but when yeah. we do when when we share it's like oh my god you go through that you go through that too yes absolutely i i read somewhere that you know like maslow's hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. shelter water food safety yep. I was reading about how there's like this new category of feeling seen and feeling heard. Ah. It's almost like the kryptonite to isolation, which we know can be deadly. 
I mean, we saw that the last couple of years. So yes, snaps to everything you just said. (laughs) And yeah, and understanding that we have this primal reaction to being vulnerable with each other, um, with many people in this case, or with our partners that we're not going to kick get kicked out of the tribe we're not going to get kicked out of the safe warm cave like we're actually going to be okay and we're also not the main character of everyone's story so it's like not really about us anyways (laughs) yeah and by the way if you do share something vulnerable or you share a need or you try to set a boundary with somebody and they x you out right they ghost you they block you they whatever whatever way is feels disruptive in your system now you have that information that that's the type of person that they are and do you want to continue to try to be in relationship with somebody that can't hold space for you that doesn't want to see you that doesn't want to hear what you have to say like I think we get so caught up in wanting to be accepted and chosen that we forget that we also get to choose who we're interacting with it's like you're, when you go on a date, when you're dating, you're not going with the, with the intention of looking, you know, beautiful enough and being smart enough to be chosen by that person. And if they choose you, then you're theirs. Like, no, fuck that. That was how our grandmothers had to do it because they needed to marry to survive, but like <laughs> they had less room Survival. to be discerning. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, and very literally that wasn't that many generations ago when women didn't have their own money, they didn't have their own means. So there was a different intention towards finding a husband. It was like a transaction with like property or like a cow. (laughs) It's so crazy. Yeah. And even back to like before women started really entering the workplace, right? It was like, you just you just existed to marry and have kids, you know, you like, and that was the focus. And so now that we're no longer in that place anymore, we can be more discerning when we show up on a date or a job interview for that matter. It's like, this is what I bring to the table. What do you bring to the table? Do our things play well on the table? Like, and then you decide from there. It's not a, all the power is not in one person's hands and that's an empowering shift especially when in the dating game of like when you're out on a date it's like wait do I like this person yes not all about like do they like me I don't know I don't know do I look good enough am I saying the right things it's like sitting up and being like wait do I want to be out with this person yes (laughs) which is Absolutely. To your point, a big cognitive shift. Huge. Because even, even in our generation, I think as millennials, we still kind of grew up with that whole media music mm-hmm. scene of like the damsel in distress or oh. the, the lady who gets saved by the night or every Disney movie oh my gosh my roommate and I were just talking actually about how we grew up in the Abercrombie and Fitch culture Mm -hmm. where it was like the smaller the daintier that you are the more you fit into that cultural mold of beauty Mm -hmm. and how we're still in our 30s shaking that shit off oh my god I think every single millennial woman I know only eats half a banana because at some point in our life, we were told that there were too many carbs or too much sugar in bananas. Like, like what? And we just, we accept this as true. We accept all of these things as true when they're not like, they're just, they're just actually incredibly untrue. (laughs) Not just the banana situation, but needing to shrink in order to be chosen. It's like, not every body type looks like that and nor should everybody have to be that in order to be beautiful. Like, oh yeah, the media's come a long way from when we were young and seeing different body types in the media now. And even back to the Disney example of like Moana, 
when I watched Moana, I was like in tears because I'm like, this is the fucking most beautiful movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> or Frozen, right? Where she just like doesn't choose the, the prince. You know, it's just like, whoa, she had a choice. <laughs> and this is real though. It's yeah. so real. It's a process, I think, of finding autonomy within ourselves so then we can remain autonomous and interdependent not codependent in our current and future relationships mm-hmm. yeah yeah how is the dating game are you in the dating game um yes i took about a year off of the dating game out of the dating game if you will i benched myself <laughs> You're on a timeout. I was, yeah, man. I was on. I was on the uh, the third line after my last relationship. I realized that I had a lot of growing to do in romantic relationship. I I realized that I don't like to be beholden to people I don't like feeling obligated to people and not that there has to be obligation in a relationship but there does require I think a bit of sacrifice Mm -hmm. and that's something that I am still working through within myself yeah um so after I put myself back out on the field (laughs) after a year of just sitting in it and being with it and getting to know myself better mm. I am back on back on the field back out on the field I love it it's it's interesting though I think that relationships serve as a mirror even going out on a date with somebody it's like who am I in this situation with mm. this particular person So yeah, if I'm being totally transparent, I mean, I have a podcast about relationships and sex in this current moment of my life. I'm not dating to settle down or find a partner, but I'm, I'm out in the dating world to get to know myself better, get to know other people better and to just play. Yes. Uh, I love that. (laughs) And then we'll see where that goes. But. Yeah. I'm a big, big, big advocate of data. I think data helps us understand things in a way that's true, more so than the stories that we make up around the thing. So when you take time to under, to know yourself, to get to know yourself, to find yourself again, and you you understand what you like you understand what you value you understand what you need you can articulate these things to another person it's still scary to articulate the things but at least you know what the things are now and you're gathering data each time that you go on a date to see how true you stay to yourself to see what they offer and if that's something that aligns with what you need and vice versa and like just getting to getting to play with who you are, getting to play with how you interact with people, going on a date on Monday and then showing up completely different on a date on Wednesday because Monday you let fear sort of take control and you slid a little bit back into the like, I hope he chooses me. And then on Wednesday, you're like, fuck no, like <laughs> this is what I'm bringing to the table, you know? And it's like getting to try all of these things out in real time with, I mean, yet there's consequence to everything, right? There's hurt feelings that come, but, but to go on dates with more of that view of like, how is this going to go instead of, I need this to go well, or I can't have another failed date. Yes. And almost like that, I feel like there's that cognitive dissonance of like, if the date didn't go well, if the two-year relationship ended, Mm -hmm. if we didn't jive after a month of a situationship, it's a failure. When in reality, it's just like data collection, like you said, with hopefully some decent sex on the side. (laughs) (laughs) 
that's data collection too. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And to that point, I'm also finding empowerment and excitement in learning how to date. I don't know, like we didn't, I didn't learn how to date really. I didn't learn how to communicate in bed. It was all like, just sort of let's throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. Oh, you like me. I like you. There's chemistry. And then we were together for two years. Yeah. You know, we were together for five years. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting being 30 and learning how to date. <laughs> And learning how to ask for what I like in the bedroom or asking them what they enjoy. So yeah, I feel very fresh to the dating game. It's a little scary, vulnerable, yeah. awakening. Yeah. But also just fun as hell. <laughs> yeah. I think to your point of, of embracing more of the kid of the play and not taking everything so seriously to mean that you're a good person or bad person or you're desirable or you're not desirable right it's like you are in bed and you have that awkward like conversation and you're like I actually don't like that or I actually do want that I want that and, you know and, you, and then you see how they respond and knowing that 99 percent of the time they are fe feeling equally as vulnerable and scared as you are so like the first person to crack that and to like name it gets like this relief wave that goes over <laughs> everybody. And it's like, well, yeah, that's like, that's scary to name those types of things. Yes. We are a generational product of Abercrombie and Fitch ads and American Pie movies. Like we, our generation is just figuring it out and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're <laughs> fucked. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but the relearning is an important piece of that because to your point there wasn't like a dating class that we took in college or high school right there was not we got sex ed at best and that was just a bunch of pictures of stds <laughs> and like pregnancy was, videos yeah yeah it's, all fear, it's fear based yes which i think so many of us are still trying to shake off yeah i i hope they're teaching sex differently these days I have I don't have kids I have no idea what's happening in the in that system um but but being at an age where you're having sex and being put on the pill and told that if you have sex you will get pregnant is not <laughs> a sustainable way to raise a child <laughs> I have um I have a question for you as somebody who just I I not just, but sometimes it can feel like just got out of a relationship. Yeah. Just got out of a relationship that was not abusive, but it was turbulent and is now new to the dating world. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice? Some do's and don'ts. <laughs> some do's and don'ts. <laughs> well, the first piece of advice is to take some time to understand who you are which sounds like you have done because when you're trying to find your match, your, your person, whatever you want to call that, you want to, you want to find somebody where it feels like you're swimming downstream together, right? You're aligned in your values. You have similar needs. You can meet each other's needs. And he, he checks off some of the wants that you want in a relationship too. So you're setting yourself up for already having this easeful existence together and of course you're going to come up to you know the rapids and the big rock and you have to navigate your way around it right but you're already moving downstream if you're choosing somebody who has a completely different value system than you you're already swimming upstream and you're already fighting something that is you know your values are the way that you orient your life so if you value self-growth and you value introspection and you choose somebody who is, you know, tall and handsome and has a lot of money and has a nice car and buys you dinner and has hot sex. But he like at his core is like therapy stupid. How much tension is that going to create in, in your existence together? Because 
your yoga, your meditation, your therapy, your introspection, your podcast, right? All of these are centered around vulnerability and self-work and deepening your understanding. And if that person inherently doesn't agree or doesn't, doesn't um, align his life the same way, it's going to be a lot harder to exist together. I need a sweet balance of chemistry, hot sex, good dinners, and also compatibility. Yes. I, yes. So the number one mistake I see women make, and I say mistake because it's painful. It's always, there's always lessons in the learning of it, but we, myself included, choose men or have chosen men in the past based on our wants. So I talk about this, this filter system of like, first, somebody needs to make it through your values filter. Do you share the same values? If they do, great. Do, can they meet your needs, right? Do they, do, do they speak your love language or can they learn your love language? Do they have the things that you need? Do you need him to have kids? Do you need him to not have kids? Do you need him to want kids or not want kids, right? These are like impeccable things that you need to feel loved and grow together. And then you get to the wants. But a lot of times women are reversing that and they're choosing men based on the wants Mm -hmm. and not so much on the other really important things. So you have this hot chemistry month or two, right? And then when things start becoming real, it's like, oh, we don't have anything in common. We don't, we don't see eye to eye. So there is, there's not, there's not a, um, I can't think of the word. It's a both and in being able to find somebody who aligns with you and that you can have passionate sex with. Like this doesn't have to be an either or experience. And in being really clear on what it is that you are looking for and what what's going to be compatible with you is vital because otherwise, how are you supposed to, you don't have like a backboard to bounce anybody off of. It's just like, oh, okay, well, whatever you like to do, all that, I'll, that'll be good for me. And whatever I, like you can give is what I need when that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the saying, um, when two become one Mm -hmm. and it's like, wait, that doesn't quite hold, hold water. (laughs) We don't ever want you to become one. (laughs) It's like, we, we want you to be orbiting together, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, you're next to each other. You're moving in the same direction, but you're still two individual beings and you can share experiences. You share, you know, relation together, but you have to maintain your, your individuality or else you're just a meshing, which is not sustainable. I loved how you said, look for somebody who you can find an easeful existence with. Mm -hmm. That was beautifully said Mm -hmm. because if we're constantly seeking out and delving into relationships with people, where everything feels like we're swimming upstream with them. We don't have energy left over for our life's passions, our careers, making money. Like we're just like feeling exhausted by this person. And that's where the confidence comes in to be like, that's cool that you value that thing. I don't, and I'm not going to put on a mask and pretend that I do because that's the other time suck energy suck that women and I'm sure men do this too but I just am more versed with women where it's like let's say he loves sports this is the easiest example and you're like oh yeah well I'll watch sports with you and it's quality time and right we justify all the reasons that we want to sit around and watch sports all day Saturday and all day Sunday and we do that for a couple of weeks and it's like fun because it's still new and then we're a month or two in and we're like fuck, we're watching sports again, right? It's not something inherently that we like, but we're pretending that we like it so that they will, they will choose us. They won't let us go. They'll think we're cool. They'll think we're whatever, right? So having the confidence to be like, I don't like watching sports and I will not watch sports with you 
And like, if that's the way that you want to spend the majority of your time, that's awesome, but we're not going to be compatible. Waking up from the oxytocin dopamine induced stupor, which is so fun and so necessary that we've evolved to have those chemical reactions Mm -hmm. when we are with or see somebody that we adore or are infatuated with. But even to the theme of your podcast, again, it's about waking up to what actually is. Yes. Yes. Not about our romanticizing discursive loops about who this person might be or their potential, but waking up to who they actually are. And how you're actually feeling. Because in in revisiting all of those questions too, because in the beginning, usually you're feeling really great and all of your needs are getting met and you're, you're in that like euphoric state because that's part of the beginning of a relationship, all the chemicals. So as things start to settle and you have to maybe speak your needs for the first time, how does he respond to that? Is he respectful? Is he curious about what you need, about what you want, about who you are? Or is it met with, oh my God, you just are creating problems or this is all your fault or you know, whatever sort of deflection comes from that. And again, knowing specifically what you, what are your non-negotiables? And making that list before you're in the chemical state. So making your sober list of this is a non-negotiable red flag, right? We get to create our own red flags. It's not just the red flags that you see on Instagram of what to look out for. It's like if a non-negotiable for you is a person who wants kids because you don't. Like... And, and not to say everything is black and white, but bringing, bringing that back to that list and being like, okay, he's not really meeting any of my needs and he wants kids. Why am I still here? It's like a due north, having your due north. So then when the storm of all those juicy, juicy neurochemicals and transmitters hit, yeah. you still can sort of see the lighthouse. <laughs> Yeah, because that's when all the, the the justifications come. It's like, yeah, he ghosts me for days at a time, but when he comes back, he tells me that I'm the only girl in the world and brings me flowers and makes me feel really good. But if one of your non-negotiables is good communication, guess what? That behavior, that ghosting behavior is not going to get better just because the relationship gets longer. <laughs> Typically that's something they view as okay or that has been okay in other relationships. And if that doesn't work for you, like that's something to consider. Yeah. Something that I'm fascinated with is what what is the catalyst that makes somebody want to leave a relationship? Because it's such a hard thing to do to end or leave a relationship. Mm -hmm. Because even when this person, say person X, is exhibiting all these behaviors or their value list isn't congruent with yours, it's so difficult to leave somebody that you have quote unquote like put in the time with Uh and formed this bond with, no matter how turbulent it may be. And I know in your line of work, you're you're sitting with a lot of women who are either trying to leave a relationship or they just left. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's like a, it's not as romantic or as cinematic as like a John Hughes film, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's just like this small moment when you're like, oh shit, do I want to be here as this person with this person five years from now? Yeah sobering sobering moments <laughs> yes and especially if we're stuck in the potential land if we're holding on to I'm gonna stay because I know he's capable of being that man again I know if if he just went to therapy he would be able to communicate if he just got a different job he would be home more right whatever the thing is and if you've been living there holding on to his potential, 
but he's not making any actions to change his circumstances. Like that's, that's when you're disassociating from what reality is. Because if you look at reality and you're like, it's been two years and he still hasn't found a therapist, even though he tells me he wants to, to work on us. He wants to go to couples therapy, but the time is not right. Right. And you've been hearing the same thing. It's like the proof is in the data. The proof is in what's actually happening, not in what we hope will happen because you have to choose your partner as they are right now. Mm. And if you aren't happy with the man that he is and the values he has and the way that he operates in his life right now, you're not going to change him. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to control him into the man that you want him to be Mm. because we don't have control of anybody but ourselves. So setting yourself up for picking somebody who has all the things that you already want, that's already seeing the therapist, that already has the job, that, you know, whatever your, your things are, it's like finding someone else who values those things because they, and they already have them because they value them. It will save you a lot of, a lot of time in potential land (laughs) or choosing the men who you think you can fix or you can save. You know, it's, it's like, you gotta, you have to fix and save yourself. Like that's already a full-time job. We don't need to bring in another, (laughs) another person. Yeah. Yeah. To tie it back a bit. So what we talked about earlier, I think when you can like taste mortality Mm -hmm. and you lose somebody close to you, it doesn't have to be a parent. Um, you have this sobering reality of just how finite our life is. And for me, at least, it completely shifted. It completely shifted my perspective on how and who I want to spend my time with especially when it comes to like romance, because I'm very blessed. I have a tight knit community of friends that have been steadfast and have been homies for a long time. But when it comes to relationships, this is somebody you're going to spend thousands of meals with. This is somebody that you will maybe merge assets with. This is somebody that you might bring a carbon copy of who they are and who you are into the world with (laughs) (laughs) on top of just sort of this like finite lens um choosing a partner is a huge decision yeah yeah and the scarcity can can come in and and convince us that we have to settle it can convince us that he's good enough or that we don't actually want the kids or that we don't actually want to get married, whatever, whatever sacrifice you're making, that means a lot to you. There's little sacrifices in relationships. Yes. But like sacrificing on your big desires, your big values, like that's something that you don't have to do. And there is somebody out there that can align with you more completely. It's just a matter of trusting that, that trusting in that because if we can't see it and we don't know when it's coming, we inherently think that it's not right. We inherently fear that it's not going to arrive or arrive on our timeline. Like if you are, you want to have a family and your clock is ticking, that's a lot of pressure to put on a relationship to be like, I got to find this guy fast to make sure he's good enough to be able to have kids. Right. And to, again, shift your, intentions with dating to be with how aligned are you not how quickly can you get married and have kids because if you have kids on a rocky foundation you're going to be divorced or you're going to be in an unhappy marriage right or kids will be sifting through all of that dysfunction yeah if you're not going to do it for you do it for them yeah when we take time to heal ourselves we are interrupting the ancestral trauma we're we're saying no to passing that down to the future generations and saving our kids a lot of therapy bills (laughs) 100 (laughs) percent yeah and that's so much easier said than done right like 
going on your 50th date this, you know, year and being like, he's a loser. He's not, that's not aligned. That was horrific. I'd rather pull my teeth out, you know, whatever. And, and choosing to say yes again, right. That takes incredible tenacity. Stamina too. Stamina. Yes. And in viewing it in more of that, like there's not so much to lose with each date because if you're setting your expectation up here and it doesn't hit, you're going to drop really far and it's going to hurt. Oh, I just read about dopamine in dating and it's Uh fascinating. So dopamine is this neurochemical that we often associate with like happiness or, or good feelings when in reality, it's about the anticipation of getting the thing. So when we think about this next date being my forever mate, we get a dopamine rush. But the kicker of it all is if you have this anticipation and this expectation of said person on this date, and you go on this date and they're just the worst ever, (laughs) um, our natural level of dopamine in our brain drops way beneath baseline. If we go into a date with little to no expectation and something really cool happens, like good conversation, good sex, potentially maybe a life partner, Mm -hmm. our dopamine skyrockets. So it's just so fascinating to me. And I love to have that like tangible neural, like neurological information to make it all make sense for myself that our expectations are definitely preconceived disappointments. Mm -hmm. So especially in the dating game, Mm -hmm. that's a great reminder. Yeah. One of my favorite sayings is committed and unattached. So being committed to doing what you can to put yourself in front of people, to, to go on dates, to experience people, you're committed to doing your part, but you're unattached to the outcome. So if you show up for that drink and he is like knocking your head on a wall, right? It's like, okay, well, I was unattached to this working out. I was committed if it was going to go somewhere to continue moving in that direction. And, you know, and it's, it's taking it less seriously. It's taking it, managing the expectations, managing the dopamine, all of, all of those things to help you stay in the marathon. If it's going to be a marathon. Because the other beautiful thing about dating is you never know when that person's going to show up. Yeah. yeah. Like you never fucking know. And so if you, if you treat every date, like it's an ultimate failure, you, you're going to be so hurt. You're going to need to protect your heart. You're going to need to hole up. You're going to need to, you know, get off the dating apps for six months at a time because you're just like burning yourself out over and over So how do you approach it differently within yourself? Because there's a lot right and wrong with the apps, right? It's frustrating and it's awesome. It's all the things and that's never going to change. So how do you, how do you change the way that you're approaching the thing? Interacting with it all. Yeah. 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 Oof. It's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) So Marissa, in doing the work and sitting with yourself in coming into stillness and acceptance and yoga and meditation and seeing mirrors everywhere, being open to seeing the mirrors everywhere, do you have any tips for people on how to actually do that when, you know, when people say, just, just be with yourself or just sit down and just meditate and you're like, what the fuck does that even mean? (laughs) Like, where, where would one start with that um, journey? Hmm. I think first and foremost, find a good teacher, not a guru, not somebody who, who says that they have a thing that you don't and to get it, you have to go through them. Mm-hmm. Cause there's a lot of those out there, especially in the wellness community. Mm-hmm find a a safe and knowledgeable teacher. If you are somebody who loves to learn on your own, um, when it comes to meditation, we're living in this new age of information. 
you could even get onto YouTube and YouTube a 10 minute meditation to down regulate after an anxiety attack. I've done that before. I mean, there's just so much information out there for guided meditations. Um, and as for looking for mirrors rather than, I think when we see other people as mirrors for ourselves, it reminds us one, that we are not the most important thing on the planet, that we're not the main character in everyone's story. Yeah. And also that we can have grace for ourselves. So I think there's a blessing and a lesson in every relationship, in every fucked up experience, um, in every yoga class. Yeah. So like awakening to the moment as it is, so then you can see, you can like see the lessons, you can start to find the diamonds in the shit. So it's not just rolling in those habitual thought patterns that we wake up with. It's like over 90% of the thoughts that we had today were the same as yesterday and the day before because we're creatures of habit. So doing the things to wake yourself up and to get you out of your own way and out of your own head. Yep. That's why making new neural pathways feels so hard because literally our brains are they function to be optimal, right? We don't, we can't spend all of our time and energy remembering how to drive each time. So we create all these neural pathways that are shortcuts to save energy and that they get really ingrained. And so to, to shift that, it's like, you know, you've gone sledding down the same hill all winter and it's grooved and it's like really nice pulling that out and walking back uphill and starting a new <laughs> a new route is it takes intention and repeated intention because to create that new thing, you have to start doing the new thing over and over and over again. So that practice of, of sitting down in meditation. And I love, I love the entry point of a guided meditation because sometimes it's really hard to be alone in the quiet with ourselves, Oof especially because we're just so stimulated all of the time. Like I know for me now, when I sit down and do a, a silent meditation, it's like the first 20 minutes is just like to-do lists and things I haven't done. And I'm uncomfortable here, you know, and it's just like, yeah. it takes a while to, to settle down. And in those moments of that mental, it feels like discombobulation, what's actually happening in those moments is you're observing your thoughts. Yeah. Even if for the entire meditation, you're thinking about the to-do lists, yeah. you're thinking about what you said at the party last night, it's, it almost creates this detachment from your thoughts mm -hmm. where the observer, which is you, slowly begins to change what's being observed which is your thoughts mm -hmm. and then without even realizing it in those moments we make that distinction we uncouple ourselves from our thoughts because I think that's where oftentimes we can go down those dark holes as we start to believe our thoughts because it can those thoughts we have can wear really sophisticated clothing mm -hmm. when in reality most of them are false <laughs> They have a lot of practice. <laughs> yeah, it's a similar or same concept that we use in parts work. It's like, how do we observe the part of you that feels like you failed? You're not a failure because when you're when you're merged with the part, you feel like a failure, right? And if you can take even one step back and say, there's a part of me that feels like I failed, that's powerful because now there's a part of you that you can comfort you've created you've 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 accessed a higher self in that distinction so same thing with the thoughts it's like you're not you're not your thoughts and we get confused because there's so much so fast all of the time that it's like if we're not stopping to check in or to observe then those things they run the show yeah absolutely mm -hmm. I had a teacher once say that he 
the the word yoga means in Sanskrit like to yoke or like unite. So I had a teacher once say that he thinks his translation of the word yoga is relationship. So I'm loving all of these Ah. (laughs) we're finding between the two. Yeah. I think the last thing that came to mind with maybe like a tip or a golden nugget that has helped me a lot is what we pay attention to expands. Mm. So in yoga, we try to pay attention to our breath to expand our consciousness into that moment. If you're on a date and you're paying attention to your phone, your consciousness is expanding into the Instagram posts, not the person that's in front of you. Yeah. So like using your attention as a tool to wake the fuck up to what's actually happening. (laughs) Or try your best to, and I'll try to do the same. Yeah. Yeah. It also feels like the more intentional we are with our focus, the more time we have, the more we can get done. The, like, it's like by trying to multitask and do all the things and be on the date and on Instagram and, you know, whatever else you're doing, it's like, it feels like the date goes by really fast or you feel like you weren't really present for whatever it was. But if you're sitting there with the eye contact engaged across the table, having a conversation, it's so much more fulfilling. So if you're going to spend your time doing something, get the most out of whatever you're doing. Yes. Time. This will be a physics lesson for me. (laughs) I'm either expands or contracts based on what we're paying attention to. Mm. I think some of us will live most of our lives and we don't remember who we talk to at the grocery store. Yeah. I can't quite remember that song that we listened to on the way to work. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's wild. There, what is the saying that um, nobody has the time? Like we we make time for the things that we we want to make time for. It's like nobody has time we have we have to be discerning with what we're doing with our time because there's only so much in a day so choosing intentionally again where you want to who you want to spend your time with what conversations do you want to be having what you know places do you want to be is it yoga is it fitness is it out for hikes like how do you want to spend your life (laughs) yeah all important to know Mm. Mm. Is there any last offering, um, message, anything else that you want to leave them with today? Hmm. Maybe like that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the grief and the breakup and the embarrassment. Mm -hmm. and the vulnerability that if you're listening you're not alone Mm -hmm. yeah we're on we're on this wild ride together (laughs) everybody's buckled in and we're going (laughs) uh I love to end these by pulling a card and I would like your interaction your help if you're open to it absolutely Okay, so just close your eyes for me and just tune into the deck, tune into the energy of the cards. And I'm starting to shuffle. So if you, whenever you feel like it's complete, just tell me to stop. Stop. Okay. 4 a.m. Can you see that? Oh, yes. (laughs) Okay, I'll read it to you too because... This deck is so, so cool. Um, Okay, 4 a.m., a time and a place of fear, uncertainty, shivers, and loneliness. The darkest time before dawn. 4 a.m. is a place where predators lurk, protected in black night air, a place of waiting for dawn to come, for light to peek over the horizon and a new day to begin. Although this dark hour feels endless at times, 4 a.m. brings a message of hope. Be still, stay warm. Solitude is not always loneliness. Blessings are 
Blessings abound in the dark quiet of the morning witching hour. Find your center and honor your instinct. Ignore the howls outside. They are not meant for you. Allow your dreams to rise up from this place of deep creativity and longing. Savor the moment. The sun is rising soon. Is that not perfect? Come on. <laughs> it's like a little too perfect. <laughs> for this conversation and for your life. <laughs> thank you for that. Oh my gosh. And yeah. thank you for creating such a, an authentic, vulnerable container. Mm. You're a natural at this. Uh, my favorite thing. My favorite thing. Oh, Marissa, thank you so much. I want, I want everyone to go check out uh, Millennial Mating. Is there anything else you want to point people towards? Do you want to talk about where you teach yoga in case people want to find you? Yes. For those who uh, reside in Denver, the River Yoga, it's a, an incredible studio. You'll walk in and, and feel like a warm hug. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, speaking from experience. <laughs> If you're looking for a teacher, you <laughs> perhaps sit with you in your 4 a.m. hour, Marissa, you, it would be an honor for anybody to be able to, to be in your, your safety that way. Hmm. Thank you so much for your time, for your vulnerability, for being who the fuck you are in this world. It is, your light is so, so, so fucking bright and beautiful. Thank you, Bree. I'm your mirror. Yeah. <laughs>